What's good, y'all? Uh, get ready for the ride of your calculus life because we're getting ready to talk about Taylor and McLaurin polynomials. Now, hopefully you've already uh, read uh, the first little article that uh, that I've posted on Classroom. Um, if you're watching this YouTube video, mm, I might have to figure out how to get that to y'all because... Hmm. Uh, but the idea of approximating a function, um, like, for example, the square root of e. Like, how do you find the square root of e? What? It, don't get a calculator now. Now do it by hand. Try to figure out the square root of e. Go ahead. Yeah, you can't. You can't really do it. Um, how do you approximate values like a sine of five degrees, the the cosine of eighty three degrees, the the square root of e? Like, how do you do that without a calculator? You guys don't even have any idea. Uh, in this modern age of computing. Like all of this fun has been taken away from mathematics because there's just a computer that'll be able to, or calculator, will be able to give you these values really quickly. You used to, have to use a slide rule, not in my day, but uh, maybe in your grandparents' day, they, were, they had to use a slide rule to, in order to figure out some of this stuff. So Taylor polynomials are a way to turn weird functions into by hand computable functions like polynomials. We can add and subtract and multiply. We can do that by hand. Um, and that's what polynomials do, right? They multiply, add, subtract, right? Um, whereas e to the x, what kind of computation is that? Sine of a thing? Natural log of a... Th I, there's no computation there. It's like you know it or you don't. So um, the idea of turning a function like e to the x or sine or cosine into a polynomial was something that was necessary back in the day. And it's, you know what? It might not be necessary now, but it's totally freaking rad that you can turn e to the x into an infinitely long polynomial. Like just, what? Yeah, it's gonna, it blows my mind too. Every, every year I talk about it, it it's, becomes radder and radder. So you check out this down here, right? Uh, the general form of a Taylor polynomial is what you should have gotten out of that uh, article that's been posted to you. It deals with a lot of factorials and nth derivative, right? So you see it down here. Um, but I want to kind of show you a visual of, of what I'm talking about. So I'm going to show you uh, e to the x. Okay, or, This ain't e to the x. That's cosine. Who put that there? So let me show you e to the x. So here's e to the x. Now what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a, a, a function whose value is the same at 0, right? 0 is a good place to, to center everything around because we know what e to the 0 is. e to the 0 is 1. So if we just graph the function y equals 1, boom, there it is. Now, it's not a great representation of e to the x, right? We have all of this error between the function y equals 1 and the function y equals x. So something that is better is to make a function whose value is the same and whose slope is the same. Well, that would be a tangent line. And you know what to do a tangent line. We did the heck out of them uh, in differential calculus. So here is a tangent line to the function y equals e to the x at 0. It's a line uh, x plus 1. Well, that, you might notice there's less error a little bit further around 0, but there's still a bunch of error as you move away from 0. Well, what's better than a tangent qu uh, line? A tangent quadratic. That's right. A tangent quadratic. Here it is. That tangent quadratic, which is x squared over 2 plus x plus 1 hugs the curve of e to the x a little bit longer than the tangent line and way longer than the line y equals 1, but you get further away from 0, there's still error. All right, so then we get to a tangent cubic. Here's a tangent cubic, and you can see that that one hugs closer and closer. Now, how many places 
are these functions, the, the line, the, the quadratic, the cubic? How many places do they agree exactly with e to the x? That's right, just one spot, just that point of tangency, which is happening at zero. So I'm just going to flood you with polynomials here. Fourth degree, fifth degree, sixth degree, seventh, eighth, ninth. That's as far as this goes. But look what, look what the heck is happening over here on this side, huh? Man, the ninth degree is super close. Now watch how I just unpeel over here on the right side. Look at that. Look how closely... Oh, man, look how closely those polynomials follow the curvature of e to the x, right? We're talking about first, second, third, all the way to the ninth derivative of these polynomial functions, which is exactly the same as what's happening at e to the x. Now, how many places do these ninth degree, how does this ninth degree function exactly uh, get you e to the x. Well, just one, just one, the point of tangency right, at 0, 1. If we keep going to 10th and 12th and 100th and 15,000th degree, how many places do those exactly agree with e to the x? Just one, right? Just the point of tangency. What if I had an infinite number of terms? Like I could just keep going, get an infinite number of terms. How many places would the infinite polynomial agree with e to the x? Everywhere. Yeah, that's right, everywhere. The infinite degree polynomial with infinite terms is exactly the same as e to the x everywhere. That's wild. <laughs> that is completely wild. So what I hope to do today with this uh, lesson is to kind of walk you through how to build one of these polynomials, right? How do we take a function and turn it into a polynomial, right, of any degree, uh, much less an infinite degree? How do we turn some regular function like e to the x into a polynomial? So I want to build one with you using the uh, using the general form here. And the general form, uh, right, of a Taylor polynomial is this thing here, right? It's the, uh, the sum from n equals zero to infinity of the nth degree of our function at c, which is the center, divided by n factorial, uh, multiplied by x minus c raised to the n. So this is a general way to build any Taylor polynomial uh, and I want to show you how to do that today. So we're going to start with cosine x. So I'm going to start with cosine x and just try to build a fourth degree Maclaurin polynomial. Now the difference between a Maclaurin polynomial and a Taylor polynomial is just that a Maclaurin polynomial is centered at zero, where a Taylor polynomial could be centered anywhere. It's just a special name for centered at zero. Like that one for e to the x that I showed you was a Maclaurin polynomial. So here's what we're going to do. So we have to be able to figure out the coefficients. And if I kind of look back up here at the general form, the, the, co the x minus c to the n part, that's like that's spoken for. But this leading coefficient, the nth degree, uh, the nth derivative of f at c divided by n factorial, that is the, that is the, the, the kicker here. We've got to figure out what the pollen, what the coefficients are. So I like to use a table. Here is the table that I like to use. Again, this table is not the polynomial. This table is not the polynomial, but it is a systematic way to figure out what the coefficients are, right? Because this is complicated enough. We want to make sure we're, we're simplified. So I'm going to have a column uh, that is n starting at zero and just choop, all the way down until I need to stop. I'm going to take the nth derivative of the function, right? Just get the, the, the representation, the analytic expression that is the derivative. Then I'm going to evaluate that at C, right, at the center value. Um, and then I'm going to divide it by n factorial. As you can see, each column just slowly builds up to that coefficient uh, that we see in the general form there up at the top, okay? So we'll do that with cosine x. So here we go. 
uh, for cosine x, we these four columns, right? So the at n equals zero, we start at n equals zero, and that is always the original function. The zeroth derivative of that function is that function, cosine x. So cosine of zero is one, uh, and then one divided by zero factorial is one. So there we go. There is a non-zero uh, coefficient. All right, so the first derivative of cosine is negative sine. Negative sine of zero is zero, so that means that that is technically a, a zero coefficient, which actually isn't a term. All right, so then we keep taking derivatives, keep going, keep going. We get negative cosine x, negative cosine of zero is negative one. Divide that by two factorial, and then you can simplify as you like. So here's a couple more uh, rows of that col uh, of that table. So we can see so far we have uh, one there, two there. We have three non-zero coefficients. All right, like I said, this table is not the polynomial. Rather, it's just a way to figure out the coefficients. And I think you probably might notice a pattern for what's happening here. Every other one is zero because we get to sign. Um, but then what's going to happen with the derivatives of, of cosine? Aren't there, every four is just going to be like recycled the way, the way that the derivatives work. So that means you're going to have positive, then negative, then positive, then negative, then positive, then negative. It's going to switch back and forth. And let's go ahead and write out the first few terms that we've gotten so far. All right, so like I said, we're going to cycle every four derivatives. So what we have so far is writing all of these coefficients, 1x to the 0, right? It was x minus 0 to the 0. So that's just x to the 0. Then 0x to the first, our coefficient negative 1 half, x squared, 0x cubed, and then 1 over 4 factorial, x to the fourth. Now those are three terms technically, because those, zero, uh, those zeros are not terms. So here are the first three terms of the polynomial, the Maclaurin polynomial for cosine of x. Now, let me just take a pause right here and show you what that looks like. Remember what we're doing here. We're trying to match a function, a polynomial function, to a familiar function like cosine e to the x, things that have infinite derivatives. So let me show you what we're doing here. Let me get to the cosine graph. Here's the cosine graph. So again, we came up with a fourth degree polynomial is what that was. It was three terms, but the, you'll remember that last one was a fourth degree. So that would be, that blue function is one minus x squared over 2 plus x to the fourth over 24. Now you can see how closely that hugs to the curve cosine x uh, around 0. So at 0, you, oh, then, then we start getting error over on that side. We start getting some error over on that side. But wait, <laughs> but wait. So let's check out, let's go back and see if we can continue this pattern a little bit longer, right? Now we... Again, we've recognized a pattern. I don't think we need that table anymore because once we realize that pattern, that, that table becomes kind of irrelevant now. We don't need that table. So let's see if we can just extend this a little bit further. Okay, there we go. So I've extended the cosine uh, polynomial a little bit further to include negative 1 over 6 factorial x to the 6th positive 1 over 8 factorial x to the 8th, negative 1 over 10 factorial x to the 10th, and so on and so on and so on. It will follow that pattern forever because of the cyclic nature of those derivatives, right? So what do you notice? What do you notice if we're trying to get a general pattern here for what cosine looks like? What would the infinity terms look like. Well, you should notice that the signs alternate back and forth, positive to negative. Um, there's only even factorials in the, in the denominators, and there's only even powers, and then those powers and factorials match up. So we need a, a, an alternating pattern, so some kind of negative 1 to the n. We need some kind of pattern that goes 2, 4, 6, 8. Oh, that's a linear pattern, right? <laughs> 
2n would kind of do that. And then the factorials are exactly the same. 2 factorial, 4 factorial. They, they increase by 2, so 2n factorial. So here is cosine x, infinite polynomial. Again, I, I can show you a picture of what is happening here. The more terms that I add, or the, the more terms, a sixth degree and an eighth degree, and I'm sorry I can't do more with this one, but you can see that extending further and further away from zero, we, that curve hugs closer and closer and closer. Again, that, that just is mind-boggling that we can <laughs> turn cosine x, right? Cosine x into a polynomial? Like, don't polynomials, like, either go both, uh, like, it to infinity or to, like, negative or they're opposite? How can we turn cosine x into an infinite polynomial? That's amazing. It's, it's just absolutely amazing to me. I love it so much. And I'm going to cut the video here so I don't have crazy long videos. I'm going to give you a second part here and we're going to do a couple more uh, problems where we're creating Taylor and Maclaurin polynomials from existing functions. Stay tuned for that. We're going to use the general form of the Taylor polynomial. So I'll see you all in the next video. Deuces.